First, I want to introduce myself, and um, then I want to give the normal caveats that anyone in my position normally gives in these kinds of forums. First, uh, I, I have to tell you, I've lived in the Middle East for many years, about 13 years of my life I lived there. I raised my children in Jerusalem, and uh, I consider myself to be an expert in virtually nothing, but I'm a student of a part of the world. And I have to tell you something. At the age of 19, I went to that part of the world for the first time, and I fell in love with uh, two peoples and a land. I am indebted to the Arab people. I have been one in my heart in wedding dances and wonderful moments with them. And then I have a deep and abiding love for my Jewish friends who have been uh, very much a part of my education. I have a master's in Near East archaeology and a doctorate in comparative religion uh, with focused primarily on the Tenaim rabbis. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, you're a happy person. But here's the truth. It means I am absolutely qualified to say, would you like fries with that order? <laughs> no one gets a degree in what I have a degree in and does anything with it of consequence, and so I have tried to follow in their footsteps. I, I want to say this. Um, driving the news cycles today... The Middle East seems to have risen right to the top, and it's constantly in front of us. And, and if, if it sounds like I'm often going back and dragging the Israel situation into the greater Middle Eastern region, it's because that's the way Middle Easterners do it. Um, historically, Israel has been uh, invoked as the reason for every kind of suffering throughout the Arab world, including the common cold. It's, it's normally done that way. And so when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you both here and in the other rooms and in the Middle East as one who's trying not to come in with anger and hatred, but to come in with clarity. And I believe that the Bible provides clarity. I need to give a couple of, um, a couple of caveats. There are three chords that I wrap my thinking in. The first one is that I'm a Christian and I'm a Bible professor. So my approach is that I take the Bible seriously and literally, and if that's not your stance, I certainly understand, but you will then put the appropriate filters on. That's where I'm coming from. Second, I'm an American, and that means that I was raised in a country that is wonderful but does not give you a high appreciation for everyone else in the world, and I didn't get that until I was 19. We, we study foreign languages but can't speak them. We go through two years of high school and we can't even manage to say, you know, can you show me where the bathroom is? We don't, we, we don't take seriously the mandate to understand the rest of the world. And it's not because we're not gracious people. It's because we have a wonderful country and we have everything here. And so we just basically don't think about what's beyond the edges of it. But when I went there, I fell in love with the Middle East and the area of the Mediterranean. And so it's a delight for me to talk about the Israeli culture and the Arab cultures. They are deep and rich cultures they are not stupid people. They are incredibly industrious people. The third thing I should tell you is I'm not a political junkie, nor am I a prophecy hound. That's a disappointment to a lot of people. Um, I teach the Bible. I teach all 1,189 chapters of the Christian Bible every single year. And I don't happen to think the prophecy portions are more important than the other portions, nor do I think they're less important. I think they're God's word. And as a result, I don't make my prophecy subservient to some moral structure, nor do I make my moral structure get set aside for my prophecy. They're all on the same plane. What God says, the Bible works as a unit in my mind. And so we're going we're gonna to take a look at it that way. I want to say something that I hope will be well received. Um, it has been my observation that people either form their politics and their social and ethical mores based on the Bible, or they formulate their idea of the Bible based on their preconceived notion of politics and social mores. In other words, some people define what's right from what's biblical. Other people define what's biblical from what they think is right. And depending upon which of those directions you come to it, you're going to arrive at different conclusions. If you have decided that because you see suffering, the person who delivered the element of the bomb that caused the suffering is therefore wrong, 
you will see no context. You will make a conclusion based on what you see. The major issue of the Middle East is that the Middle Easterner thinks very, very differently than an American. An American believes that new is better. That's why we have new written on the sides of our detergents. We want you to know that we've come up with a new way to do it. A Middle Easterner thinks the old way is the better way. That you do it the reliable way. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so as a result, they stand on the shoulders of their fathers and they believe with all their heart that everything that justifies their current position is based on yesterday. That's why you can't hardly begin to speak about the Middle East without going into a historiography. Because context is everything. I I, want to begin with a statement that I hope will offer some context to the situations, and then I'm going to answer some of the questions I was handed, and then we'll get into the, as, as it rolls, get into the other questions as well. The opening questions I was given ahead of time, I'm going to spend a little bit longer on because I'm hopeful that they'll answer other questions that you would have thought of. First, I want to uh, uh, present to you that I believe the foundation of truth is the Bible. Uh, I'm not selling that to you tonight. Uh, You can come back on another service and I'll do my best, but that's not what I'm doing tonight. I just want to say that that, um, you're not going to understand where I'm coming from if you think the physical issues are the primary issues because I believe the spiritual issues are underlying the physical ones. I believe that behind the dirt and the fight over the dirt is something else. And I believe that the Bible specifies what it is and who is a part of it. I also believe that peace begins in the heart, and a heart at war produces hands at war. And you'll never have peace until you come to the place when you have settled your own heart issue with your Creator and with your fellow man. Second, I believe that all people of the region deserve our love and prayerful consideration. If you came to watch me beat up on one side or the other, you came to the wrong place. I vehemently oppose violence. I don't really care what your point is. Violence is the wrong way to make it. But I don't hate one people group and love the other. I have way too many friends on both sides of this conflict. So the way I like to describe it is this. Did you ever have a couple and you love both of them and they got a divorce? They don't like each other, but you like them both? It's kind of like that. So the third thing I want to say is I don't believe the issues in Israel and Gaza stand alone. I believe that they're tied to the larger issues of the region. In 2010, a Tunisian vendor set himself on fire in a market and burned the whole Middle East. He started what's called the Arab Spring, and it became a morphed battle between Sunni and Shiite Islam. Sunni represents about 85, 87% of Islam. The balance of them are Shiites. Shiites are people who are controlling major governments, and in many cases, they're governing people that are not a part of their sect of Islam. It would be like the red state, blue state situation where you have a state that's almost entirely red, but the guy at the top is blue. And you can't imagine that could happen. I I want to divide my time into thinking into a couple of topics, Israel and the Palestinian conflict, Israel and the regional conflict, Boko Haram, ISIS, Hamas, Hezbollah, these are Islamic radical groups, and the West's conflict with them. I want to address specifically Christianity's weakening grasp on a singular commitment and what it's doing in our colleges. And I want to look um, a little bit forward to why educated Americans seem to be abandoning their historical supports. We are changing in how we approach this this uh, situation in the Middle East, and our media is changing, and our educational system is changing, and there probably needs to be some words as to why that's happening. First question that was given to me is, who are the players in the situation of Israel and Gaza? Um, I'm to differentiate between Hamas and the Palestinians, and I think that's a fair question. In antiquity, Israel is the children of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. That nation-state had uh, went through a tremendous turmoil. 
uh, including the civil wars that went on between them for a number of years. And then the northern kingdom got peeled off and sent away into Assyria. The southern kingdom, 140 years later, was peeled off, taken into Babylon. And there they sat. And the end of our Old Testament, as we often call it, the Hebrew Scriptures, is about the return back to the land and the pasting together of some pieces of Judah when most of the pieces of the northern tribes had been lost. And there were prophets that were saying, like Jeremiah, that God... God was going to put them all together. Ezekiel 37, I'm going to actually take both Israel and the long lost Judah, Judah and the long lost Israel, put them back together, and I am going to make them one people and I'm going to give them back a land. Interestingly enough, uh, sometime around the time period of the New Testament, the rising tide of anti-Roman sentiment that developed in the New Testament period caused Rome to take and pay attention to Israel. Now, there's something else going on there. The only other large empire that could take Rome and beat them on the field of battle was the Parthian Empire. And they happened to be in Babylon And as a result, the Romans took the Jews more seriously than you would have taken them. They were a minor player in the New Testament period, but they became a major player because they were the frontier to the only other empire that ever beat you in a battle. And if you're Rome, that bugs you. And so you're not only going to sack their temple, you're going to make a major, right in downtown of the forum of of Rome, you're going to make a celebration of how you destroyed the Jews. In the time period, the Jews rose up twice in revolt, and after the second revolt was put down by the Romans in the second century, they called the place no longer Judea, Proinquia, Judea. They then called it Palestine, Palestina. And that was the name Philistine. And it was given to the land to deride the Jewish people. It was given to them to, so that the Romans could say, that's not your land, it belongs to Philistines. That name was revived again. Um, the Philistines were actually three tribes, the Tejeker, the Sheridan, and the Palest. They come together. They are, we think, perhaps Greek in background, but they made their way onto the shores during the divided kingdom period of the Old Testament, and they actually flourish there. And the Palest are the Philistines. The term Palestinian, then, is a revival of a term that has to do with the Romans. The British reused the term. They weren't trying to slap people around, I don't think. I think they were trying to say, this was the old Roman Palestine, so we'll call it British Mandate Palestine. The problem with that was both Arabs and Jews were Palestinians at that time. And so the term Palestinian has morphed and changed over time. At one time, a Jew could be a Palestinian. Today, the Jewish population of the, um, of the Palestine National Authority's territory is exactly zero. So there's obviously a change. The Palestinians themselves are largely Sunni Arabs, and they are, in fact, um, represented by a number of different groups. Let me see if I can take the complication of the Middle East crisis in Israel and boil it down to a simple story, which is, of course, ludicrous. Okay, But I'll try it anyway. Moshe Schwartz is a Polish Jew. It's coming to the end of the 1800s. He sees the pogroms. He sees the rise of anti-Semitism. He sees that his family is not going to be safe. He sees that his fortune and his farm are going to be lost. And so what does he do? He liquidates everything and sells them, and he takes a bag of money, and he gets on a boat, and he makes his way to this place that is now um, the end of the Ottoman Empire and a place called Palestine. Moshe Schwartz goes in, lives there along the area of Jaffa for a while. The British come and defeat the Ottomans in the First World War. And Moshe says, this is my chance. I'm going to go and buy a piece of land. So Moshe takes his money that he's been storing in his bag, and he takes it into the British assayer's office, and he plunks down his money, and he says, I want to buy a piece of this land. The British assayer brings out his uh, charts and he looks at some diagrams and he looks at some maps and he marks off and he says, all right, I'll give you this piece of land. Moshe gives him all the money he has, holds back a little bit so he can get himself a donkey, a cart, a shovel, a pick, uh, a couple of seeds, and a little bit of the uh, things he's going to need just to set up a homestead. Moshe makes his way out to a a hill someplace in the southern part of the country. And when he arrives there, a fellow by the name of Musa Adin has a tent sitting on the property. 
Musa doesn't have a piece of uh, a paper that says he owns it. He says his father's father's father owned it. But there's no paperwork. The Ottomans didn't do paperwork. So Moshe has spent everything he's got. He's got nowhere to go because now he's standing on his piece of property and he's got a piece of paper that was given to him by the British assayer's office. And Musa, who can't read, says, uh, so what? And when it really gets hot, the British leave. And that's how we got where we are. You have two people, one place and no place to go. One says they walked in and bought what they could. The other one says, I wasn't selling. And I don't know who gave you permission to buy my land. And so as a result, what you have, the Palestinian people are made up of the sons of those who have been Sunni Arabs living in the land or those who moved there during the time that people were moving in. Because when you move in, there's work. And when there's work, there's people moving in. And so as a result, the Palestinians, over time, become a people. And the Israelis, not Israelites, we use that term for biblical people, the Israelis come in. And in 1947 and 48, the nations said, let's do a split here. Israel said, we'll take it. The Arab nations around them said, we won't. And the war began. President Truman and the American government, because of some some very strong biblical and evangelical leanings, wanted to stand on behalf of Israel. Anyone who denies that reality hasn't read the people of that period. They believed that God was doing something and that they were stirred by that. And, and so they, they backed Israel. But at the same time, they also recognized we are in the middle of a Cold War. And they also recognized that if they didn't grab on to this nascent democracy, there would be yet another totalitarian government and we didn't need another one. As a result, you have Israel, you have the Palestinians. Hamas is a relatively recent character. Um, Sheikh uh, Ahmed Yassin was one of the co-founders. He died in a rocket attack in 2004, but he actually uh, co-founded Hamas, and Hamas was set up with, in in the 1980s, uh, with the understanding that they would be, in fact, the people that would drive Israel into the sea and eliminate them. Hamas's charter 12 times calls for the elimination of Israel. In fact, what it says is, Hamas has been looking forward to to implement Allah's promise whatever time it might take. The prophet, prayer, and peace be upon him, said, the time, will not, uh, the time will come when Muslims will fight against the Jews and kill them, until the Jews hide behind rocks and trees which will cry, O oh, Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. Now, further down in the document it says, um, peace initiatives and so-called peaceful solutions and the international conferences to resolve the Palestinian problem are all contrary to the beliefs of the Islamic uh, resistance movement. For renouncing any part of Palestine means renouncing part of your religion. The movement educates its members to adhere to its principles and to raise the banner of Allah over the homeland as they fight their jihad. It goes on and says there is no solution to the Palestinian problem except by jihad. It concludes, the initiatives, the proposals, the international conferences are a waste of time and exercise in futility. The Palestinian people are too noble to have their future, their right, and their destiny submitted to a vain game. The charter of the Hamas was written in 1988, so you might be sitting there going, well, maybe they've updated, so I'll give you something from two weeks ago. Hamas's official position, our doctrine is fighting you, Jews, and we will exterminate you. We will not leave a single one of you alive because you are alien usurpers of the land and eternal mercenaries. I mention that so that we have some clarity about who it is we're dealing with. There's all kinds of attempts on the Americans' part to go in and negotiate, but I don't know how you negotiate with somebody who says, I want to just kill the other guy. Um, There's a cartoon that I saw recently where... uh, Uh, Mr. Kerry is sitting across from Mr. Netanyahu and says, look, they want to kill all the Jews. Can't you come halfway? (laughs) That's what it sounds like to the Israeli. It sounds like you're saying, put up with so much terrorism. And don't be too heavy-handed because you want to be proportional in your response to someone who's aiming at your child. Now, I'm not going to represent this fairly if I don't also say that Islam has one critical problem. It is the most 
frustrating problem to anyone who ever tries to deal with the Muslim community. If you're dealing with Catholicism, where do you go? You go to the Vatican, right? And you look for the guy with the biggest hat. I'm, respectfully, you, what you do is you, you engage those who understand canon law and who have worked through the whole understanding of that law and, and sitting there on the chair of St. Peter, somebody is able to utter, this is what we do. The problem is Islam doesn't have a pope. In fact, it's 85% one denomination, 15% the other denomination, and nobody gets to speak exclusively for what Islam believes. Sharia law is a constant changing thing. It's based on an understanding not just of the Quran, but of the two different views of the Hadith. So if you're Sunni, your understanding of what is really Muslim is completely different than if you're Shiite. Who do we see about that? Who do we see when 400 people get together and say blowing up children in a bus is a legitimate expression to stand against occupation? Because as soon as we do, somebody trots out in the media and says, but wait a minute, you don't understand. We're really very peaceful. We have these passages from the Quran about peace. Who do we see about that? The problem is there isn't any one structure, and that's the frustrating part. Everybody gets to reinterpret it. I simply argue that somebody should be held to their own text. I'll be held to mine if you'll be held to yours. I'll be held to the Bible if you'll be held to the Quran and the Hadith and you are actually able to give me one line of what's right and what's wrong. This is one of the problems. Now, that means to the modern mind, I need you to see this. To a modern educator, Islam sounds like more of a conversation and Christianity sounds like right and wrong. And they love the conversation. The problem is with the conversation, the name Islam means submission. So the conversation isn't conversant as much as you might think. There are rules. Except for it's difficult to know what they are. So you will constantly find yourself frustrated by that. One of the things I want you to know, there's a second question that was given to me. For a believer, what's the appropriate response to what Israel is doing to protect itself? Well, the question sort of leans into Israel being right, and, and uh, I, I think the person who said that probably intended it that way. Let, let me say it this way. For 35 years, since uh, November 4th of 1979, when I was a high school student, you can do the math, um, We've been at war with extreme forces in Islam. Since our embassy was taken in Iran, to this day, we have had one successive battle after another with something that is called radical Islam. Nigeria understands Boko Haram. Hamas is in Gaza. ISIS is now, uh, is now in not just Iraq. They're also in Syria and they are in Lebanon. They are there. They are already there. Despite our attempts to make them isolated to one country, we keep looking at the region as though it's countries. They look at it as though it's a nation. They look at it more like states. We look at it as individual countries. Hezbollah's in Lebanon. Hezbollah's in Syria. And, and what's actually stopping them from knitting together one patchwork of things to create one dominating Islamic view is the infighting between them. Now, I share that with you because there's a moral paralysis that's going on in the Western mind that can't seem to embrace the idea of right and wrong. What's happened in our moral relativism that we've been teaching since the 60s till now is it's left the West with the inability to say somebody's right or somebody's wrong. So if you listen to NPR, what you'll hear is different narratives. That's a way of saying everybody's really right. But here's the thing. When one guy says, I'm going to kill the other guy, they both can't be right. You can't meet in the middle on that. And so the problem is, these, these narratives get launched as conversations. Here, here's the truth. Either rockets were fired from hospitals or they weren't. If they were, the fourth article of the Third Geneva Convention says that's a war crime. Now, you might say, well, that's Israeli propaganda, but the Frenchman who went there totally against the Israelis had them fire it right behind his back, and it's on camera. The Indian who came from India in the free press 
documented three different places where the United Nations bases were being used to fire rockets. That's a violation of everything we know. So now you can go, well, I'm not going to believe this rhetoric or that. Okay, who are you going to believe when you now have people who are against that cause but end up standing and putting it on film? So what do you do? The bottom line is Hamas states it wants to kill Jews. It will eliminate Israel, and on that basis alone, they should not have a a, a seat at the civil table. You don't get to be talking to civil nations when that's in your charter 12 times. You just don't get to be there. If you promote death and thuggery among the dear Arab people that you are over top of, and now you become a threat to your neighbors, then, frankly, whatever happens to you will happen to your neighbors. And there's nothing we can do about that. There simply is nothing we can do. There is no blockade bad enough to justify funneling money from humanitarian aid to build a circuit of tunnels. If things were so bad in Gaza, they might have been helped significantly if they didn't use all that humanitarian aid concrete to build an underground network of tunnels. If they couldn't get the water running, instead of building a rocket, build a pipe. That's what the pipe was put there for. Now, you're going to hear that, um, well, you have to understand, Gaza is so crammed with people, but I may be the only person in this room that's been in and out of Gaza uh, more than a dozen times. It isn't. There are three cities in Gaza, and then big open spaces between them that were farms. The idea that they're all, like, shoved in there is not true. I have been standing in places, seeing piled high food markets at a time when they were reporting that the people were starving. So I don't know what to tell you about all that. I can tell you that there is no land theft argument that justifies abducting children of any kind for any reason. I can tell you that we cannot be confused by moral truth. I argue that the Palestinian people are by and large both industrious and smart people. They really are. They love, they thrive, they feel. They are dear to me personally. These aren't cattle. But they are being brutalized by the people who run them. And now the people who run them have become a problem for their neighbors. They've been led into an immoral proposition that includes sacrificing your children for a cause. And the truth is to kill non-combatants because you want to make a point is simply morally wrong and reprehensible. If the West doesn't find a way to stand and say that clearly, that nothing justifies targeting civilians and nothing justifies locking them down so that they sit in a place where a retaliatory strike is going to come down on their head, nothing justifies blowing up a school bus, nothing justifies this, it's not only going to kill Jews, But in 25, 35, 45 years, it'll kill Arabs. See, once you train a group of people that the right way to protest is blow up a bus, they'll blow up their own. Death promotes death. It's not going to stop there. That's why I've been arguing inside the Palestinian Authority that this will kill your people. Don't tell them that. That thinking accepts the idea that you can um, empower people to act savagely. Ask Robespierre how that works out. Because eventually that same guillotine comes back and takes your head. A murderer is somebody who plots the killing of another person to advance their own cause because they're too impatient to convince them by other means. There's another question that was given to me. This question was, are the promises to the people of Israel made in the Old Testament still in effect for the nation of Israel as we know it today? I think that's a really good question. Leviticus 25 says that the land that Israel is on belongs to God, not Israel. It doesn't belong to the Palestinians and it doesn't belong to the Israelis. It belongs to God. He said so in Leviticus 25. By the way, he said it cannot be sold permanently, forever. In case you're not sure on that word forever, Christians really hang on that word. I want to go to heaven forever and I don't want it to mean until something else happens. Interestingly enough, the, in Genesis 12 and in Genesis 13, the stewardship of the land was given to Abraham. And then later in Genesis 26, uh, Genesis 23 and Genesis 46, it will be bequeathed through Isaac and through Jacob. By the way, not through Ishmael, even though Abraham wanted it to be through Ishmael. When God said, I'm going to give your promises to Isaac, Ishmael sa- uh, or, or Ab- Abraham said, oh, that Ishmael would get them. But that's not how it happened. The biblical text says 
that the title in Genesis 17, verses 7 and 8, check me out, the title to the land of steward, the stewardship title to the land was given in perpetuity, meaning it will always belong to God and always be titled to this Jewish people. Now, either the Bible's true or it's not, but if it is, it says that the land has been titled forever. You, you can do what you want to do with that. You can make it spiritual if you want, but it actually says the children through your loins. That sounds pretty darn physical to me. So in reality, what you have is there's no one who can make the argument that that's been done away with and that the Bible's literally true. One of those two arguments will stand opposed to each other. I also want you to know that when God told Abraham in the beginning that the land would be for him and his children forever, he also invited him to know that they would be taken into captivity for a period of time and that they would not have domicile on the land. So when you're there is not the same as whose it is for. From the very beginning, you can read in Genesis 17 that it was to Ishmael and Isaac, and you can read all the way through the scriptures. By the way, in case you're wondering what we should call it, Ezekiel 37 called it Israel, not Palestine. And, and, and I will just tell you that it seems to me that if you're going to take the Bible seriously as I do, you are forced into the position of saying, God said, I'm going to do something in a group of people that is a physical through your loins group of people. And, I, and he, he either isn't going to do it because he wasn't really serious when he said it, or he's going to do it. Those are your choices. Your third choice would be, well, we could make it spiritual, where, you know, red means this and blue means that. And nobody knows what anything means. The problem is people that spiritualize the Bible within a few years stop reading it. Why? Because it's, you might as well have a Ouija board. If it doesn't mean what it says, then I don't know what it means. And what are we doing here? So literally, I want you to step back for a moment and I want to offer you what I think is the story of the Bible that gets entirely messed up if you don't look at the literal view of the Bible. The Bible says this, God in the beginning created heavens and earth. Man rebelled and mutinied against him. God decided that he would show his love through a people. So he fell in love with a nation. And God the Father loved that nation with an everlasting love. The sun, moon, and stars will fall from heaven before he will give up on that love, Jeremiah 30, 31 says, that, that he has an everlasting love for her, Isaiah 59. But she didn't love him back. She ran off and had other suitors. And eventually, he had to divorce her, put her away. But not until they had a son. The woman... Israel had a son with a heavenly father through an Israelite girl named Mary. And that son was told to now choose of many nations, of many colors, of many people, a wife. And by the way, one of your jobs is to, as you become this, this engaged one to the son, you are to teach what the, to the estranged wife of the father what it means to be a wife. And someday, someday soon, 1 Thessalonians 4 says, a trumpet sounds, and we who are the betrothed of the Son are called to a wedding. And when we are, the Father then turns back to his estranged bride, who is now has all of the nations of the world beating down on her, and she has found out that no one really loves her but her husband. And finally, after seven long years, she looks up and here comes a rescuer and she looks up and sees him whom she has pierced. And he comes in the clouds and he rescues her and that's the end of the Bible. There are two marriages here. They're distinct marriages. And I would call to your attention that when Paul was writing, he spent as long in Romans in 9, 10, and 11 explaining God's position for Israel, ending by saying that all of them standing there when he comes back, all of them, 100% of them will be saved in that hour. He spends as long discussing the future of Israel as he does discussing justification in Romans 1 to 3. So in the argument of the letter, he even says, do not be arrogant toward the branches. And that is what I think replacement theology is doing today. It's replacing Israel with a new Israel, saying we are. Listen, here's my problem. If God replaced Israel because she misbehaved, have you looked at the church recently? Is anybody worried? Because we ought to be. We are not more moral than she was. We are as self-willed and as mutinous as Israel ever was. 
God's promise is to bring together the long lost relatives of the house of Israel and put them into the land. Can we all just, especially those of you who were around in the end of the 40s and the beginning of the 50s, can we all just admit that one of the reasons the world is having such a struggle with Israel is they represent a literal fulfillment of the word of God in the Bible. And if that's true, then the Bible might be true. And if that's true, the college professor says, then I can't sleep with whoever I want in my class. And that's a real problem to him. So the issue is that when we look at the text, it's either literally true or it's not. Somebody asked the question, what can, what can you tell us about Palestinian Christians and what's happening to them? Palestinian Christians are called Nasrani. Uh, uh, there are about a million of them in the world, about 25% of them in the West Bank and Gaza. 8% of the West Bank population is Palestinian Christian now. In Gaza, it's less than 1%. For the evangelical Christians in the room, you'll understand what I mean when I say about 1,400 Gazans are represented in the words born again. And that's a little bit under 200 families, and there is a network of churches that are being used right now to keep them fed because they do not get the aid that goes to the uh, other families around them for a number of different reasons. When people go to Israel, they don't understand when they're going through the West Bank why there are different flags. Um, For a while, you're driving under the blue and white Israeli flag, and then all of a sudden you're under a Palestinian flag when you get to Jericho or when you get to Bethlehem, when you get to Ramallah, when you get to to Gaza or Hebron or Kalkilia or Tuharm. And what it is is this. Back in the days of Rabin and Arafat, both who have left this earth, back in those days they set down an agreement. And what they said was, we're going to take these territories that are primarily Arab and we're going to exchange them from Israeli supervision to Arab-Palestinian supervision. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make three kinds of, of areas, A, B, and C. They did that because they thought it would be incredibly simple, right? So A will be, we're going to turn over everything to the Palestinians and we're going to back up and let you run your own civil administration and then you can have a police force. They can have assault weapons. They can have tanks. They can, it's a police force. It's some police. Anyway, it's a really big police force. You can do that. Now, in the B category, we want you to take over civil administration and run the trash trucks, but we want to patrol the streets with you because we suspect that there are some areas there that are really touchy. Under C, we want the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, to patrol the entire land and we want them to be responsible and eventually all C properties will become B, B will become A, and in the end you'll have everything. Right in the middle of that, these guys died. And what you have now is a patchwork that no one can figure out. And you literally move along roads and you have to ask yourself, is this an A road or a B road? What, what, who, am I, who am I supposed to be paying attention to? And driving in those roads can be quite um, interesting. The, the issue is the Palestinian Christians find themselves as a minority of a minority and largely a far, forgotten group. I will tell you that I taught in a Palestinian Christian school I also taught in an Israeli school at the same time. One was in the morning, one was in the evening. You just got to remember who you're talking to. Um, and, and I had wonderful students, many of them Muslim students, and some of them were the funnest students I've ever had. I gave them Exodus. I said, I want you to go home and I want you to read Exodus. They'd never read the Bible. I gave them all Bibles. They didn't. 50 students. One guy came back and said, this story is great. Somebody has to make a movie out of this. I didn't have the heart to tell him. So... What I can tell you is that they're largely living on top of places where biblical events occurred, utterly ignorant of those events. They can be, they can be sitting right on the rock that David composed a song and they wouldn't know it. If, you know, I, they just have no idea. And so I found it to be a joy and a privilege to be able to crack open the Bible and have the first pass in the Bible with them. Another question was, how does the current conflict fit biblically? Is this a pre-tremor to what will be coming as God unfolds his plan? I think you probably gave away part of this. Jeremiah 31 said that I'm going to gather the people up into their land and I'm going to put them back in the land and sometime later I'll put a new heart within them. We're right in the middle of that. In my view, we're right in the middle. They're back in the land, but they, they actually are as pagan as all of the people around them. For the most part, there's a a Jewish ethic that's involved in their life. There's a kind of a Judeo ethic in the background there. But frankly, the largest uh, 
um, gay rights parade goes on in Tel Aviv. So I'm, you're not talking about people who think necessarily biblically, literally, even though they come from the Bible. One of the great problems that modern Israelis have is, who are we once we've dissed the Bible? Because they want the, they want the modern mores of dissing the text, but that's where they get their identity. And so they have an identity issue. And if you know Jewish people, they will often struggle with the issue of identity. I say this lovingly, but I say it honestly. They will say, you know, the world looks at us and they, tell us, they, they corner us because we're Jews. They can't get halfway into a sentence without saying, you know, he's a Jewish comedian. They, they do it themselves. And they don't understand the identity crisis they're in. I believe identity is found when they are whole again. And I believe they'll be whole again when they find the one that completed all that God promised them, the one who sits on the throne of David, the one who completes the work that he was given. Somebody asked a very, very interesting question. I got to tell you, this question really drove me nuts. The question is, what does it mean for a believer in Jesus to support Israel? What does that mean? Does that mean everything they do is right? I I live there. Can I just tell you? No. You will learn that their road crews look like our road crews. One guy working, four guys standing there with cups of coffee in their hands. They look identical. They're not holy float above the earth. They're just people. But here's the thing. Christians, evangelical Christians at least, have generally supported Israel. About four years ago, a family that I cherish and love had a son that um, put out a movie. The movie was called With God on Our Side. I spoke out very publicly against that movie and it harmed my relationship with that family and with the church from which they came and cut a lot of support for the mission that I represent. American evangelicals were challenged by a movie that has floated all the way to Iraq and gotten wonderful hearings because it's entirely critical of Israel. And the position is sort of like this. What they did was they said, we don't think that America's support for Israel is based on the Jewish lobby, because that's only 2% of the American people. We think it's based on the evangelical lobby. So in order to deal with this, we've got to go directly at the evangelical schools and evangelical organizations. The megachurch, Willow Creek, was one of the first places they went. Wheaton College, World Vision, You will find these on lists of people that now no longer support the state of Israel and no longer support that God even has a future for the Jewish people, literally. Christians don't all support Israel for the same reason. Some people do it because of eschatology. They believe in the end times God is going to regather the people. Some of them actually believe that that this is a providential evidence that God has has, um, fulfilled something for the chosen people. Other people say, listen, it's the only democracy in the Middle East, so we've got to hang on to it. They're, They're much more pragmatic. Some people just simply say, look, there was historical suffering of the Jewish people, and much of that was caused by the church. We owe them at least a piece of ground. So you've got a lot of different reasons why people stand for Israel. They're not all one thing. Now, part of this is the way people get to think in the land. I want to share with you a story, and maybe this story will help you. Uh, Maybe it'll just confuse you. We were living for a while at a place that is a Vatican-owned property. Um, It's called Tantor. It's the Ecumenical Biblical Institute. I was staying there while we were waiting to get an apartment, and the Catholic Church was nice enough to let us have a very nice apartment there. I was very happy with it, and um, we, we really enjoyed our time there. During that time, the Israelis had set up a roadblock causing the Palestinians to have identity checks to get in and out of Jerusalem because we were having a problem with bombers. And so what they were trying to do is determine who's coming in and how are they getting in. But unlike our Congress, they didn't like the idea of a porous border. So what they decided to do was make sure that everybody was funneled down to one place. Now, they hadn't yet built this wall or fence, but, but they had funneled everybody down, and they put soldiers along the way. But there was a path. If you jumped the wall in the back of Tantor, you could go through the Catholic property and avoid the Israelis down below, and you didn't have to show your ID. Well, the problem is the Israeli soldiers got wise to it, so they came up and started walking along the wall. So Palestinians came up with Molotov cocktails and burned the whole field outside. And the rector ran out and said, you stupid Israelis, you caused my whole place to be burned. Now I need you to follow the logic. Here's a law. Somebody's subverting the law, but it's the officer of the law who's at fault for the situation. If that makes sense to you, then you understand the Middle East. 
Because after you're there for a while, everybody's walking around switching the donkey in the cart. And you're, they're shooting us in the streets. Yeah, but you're throwing rocks at them. Yeah, but they're shooting us in the streets. Then stop throwing rocks at them. But they're shooting us in the streets. That's logic. And that actually makes sense to people. Do not be arrogant toward the branches, but if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root that supports you. You will say then, the branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right, they were broken off for your unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, be in fear. Behold the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you, God's kindness. I do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, of a mystery and not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now listen, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are today enemies for your sake, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of their fathers. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they will also be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Oh, the depths and riches of wisdom and knowledge of God. Paul thought that in the future, these events were going to happen. They weren't fulfilled in Jesus because they hadn't happened as of the time he wrote Romans. He said, this is going to happen, and we should understand it and take it into account. I want you to listen to the leader of Relevant magazine, Cameron Strang. He wrote these words. Theology can be debated. You can have a lot of different views of the end times and different readings of the books of the Bible that that, that may speak to that. But those seem overridden by Jesus' teaching that we should love our enemies, that we should do justice that we should walk with humility and love and we should take care about Christian believers in different parts of the world. Sounds very reasonable and it's totally wrong because what's right is determined by the text. What's moral is determined by the text. Doing justice requires you know what the justice is. If you walk in with all moral, everybody's right, then you can't do justice at all. And the bottom line here is that He's walking around saying, look, you really can't understand what the Bible says in all these other areas anyway. We can't all agree, so let's not have an ethic based on them. If it's not based on the text, then where are you going to get the right and wrong ethic from? Who's going to say what's right? By the way, this tickles the ears of a lot of evangelicals because they run around saying we're pro-Israel, we're pro-Palestine, we're pro-peace. But when you have the official representatives of one that says they want to kill the other, how can you be pro-everybody? These are the kinds of things that are happening in our schools. Let me take some of the other questions here. Um, The question is, can you tell us anything about the Balfour Declaration of 1917? Yes, I can tell you that Lord Balfour was, uh, in 1917, he was trying in the House of Commons to create language to help deal with the Jewish problem. You have to understand that the issues of World War II weren't the only time that Jews were undergoing a massive persecution problem. They started, um, well, they started in the early church, but all the way back in 1880s, you have a series of pogroms, a series of of rejections and a series of of burnings and uh, synagogues being removed from people, people being moved from one place to another. The British had a sensitivity for a time. I believe it was a leftover of their biblical roots which, by the way, you'd be hard-pressed to find now. But in that leftover of biblical roots, I think that Lord Balfour wanted to be able to write a white paper in which he could say that there is a legitimate place for the Jewish people in the land. As a result, some Jews, uh, and this is, we're now dealing with the time of, of Herzl and others, uh, picked up this idea and said, yes, the British are for something. You have to understand, though, how political machines work. Um, Today, you can have one guy in our government saying this is horrible, the other guy saying it's right, and they're from the same government. And what I think you have is this ambiguous statement that was dropped into 1917. It gave a lot of people hope of a division of land between two peoples, but I would suspect it wasn't as clearly held and it was not as widely thought of as either side would like to to say. 
question is, how do you differentiate the Zionists and the Zionist movement from the Jewish people? Is there a difference? Zionism is the belief that God will literally bring the people back to a land and that that land will eventually end up with them in peace. It sounds very similar to Ezekiel. Now, the problem is that as soon as you make an ism out of something, you create all the modern debate that goes with it. I I am not a Zionist. I'm a Biblicist. If it's in the Bible, I'm for it. And if Zionism is against it, then I'm against what they're for. That's, That's just the way it is. But, but where you agree with somebody, don't try to not agree with them just so you don't get their ism stuck to you. Because all that ism is coming on me. Here's the thing. Zionism is the idea that Zion, which, by the way, was a Canaanite term for the land and probably the land of Jerusalem, that, that uh, um, the land itself would be at the center of the heart of the future aspirations of the Jewish people. You're talking about a people that for 2,000 years lost their language and lost their land. You're talking about a people that got kicked out of that land by Romans. They didn't leave voluntarily. They were enslaved. The price of slaves bottomed out after 70. It was cheaper in Rome in the year 75 to starve your slaves and buy another than it was to feed your slaves. There's so many Jews on the market. What are you going to do? And and when you stand there in Rome and you see the Colosseum, I want you to remember that was built in 79 to 81, and that was built with the proceeds of the fall of the temple in Jerusalem. Temple goes down, Colosseum goes up. Cash from there went to there. And so when you're standing in these places, it's hard for us to remember that Jewish people got forcibly removed from the land. They, They weren't invited. They were removed. At the same time, I would tell you this. The way Zionism is being phrased today, it's often seen as a colonial oppressor that brings apartheid and and, and attempts ethnic cleansing. I I find it interesting that Jews are getting tagged with ethnic cleansing when the only people that actually have it in their charter 12 times that they want to kill somebody else just because of what they are, uh, are the people in Hamas. I don't believe the Hamas represents the heart of the Palestinian people. I believe it represents the darkness. I believe they're a deceived group of people. And I am not angry at them. I hurt for them because they are held by the clutches of a prince that won't let them go. I I think that one of the things I want to say, there was a question handed. uh, uh, Some of the press in the U.S. is uh, saying that the U.S. is being very anti-Israel, but then Netanyahu comes out and says that Kerry and Obama have been very supportive. What is the U.S. position? I have no idea. I follow this daily, and I can't figure out what our position is, but here's what I want to tell you. I want to tell you why I pray for my president and what I'm praying for my president for. I I believe he's surrounded by some very smart men from some smart universities, and that's the problem. I believe that the West is at war with the Bible, and that is the reason why there are people in colleges that are applauding Anything that will make the Bible not look literally true. How do I know? Well, because I've worked with history and I've worked with A, Arts and Entertainment Network, and here's what I know. I could put together the best video on the planet on how the Bible's literally true, and it will not see airtime. But if I criticize the Bible, I'll get airtime, even if it's sloppily done poor history. I've watched it now for 30 years. I know it's true. And so the bottom line is that that Israel represents the veracity of the Bible's hope of a literal set of fulfillments. And as long as Israel is there, then the Bible might be true. And we can't have that. Sitting in the Oval Office giving counsel to our president, I believe there are people who are concerned about any claim of this foolish Bible's veracity. I believe that underlying the agenda is more than just they want the underdog to succeed. I believe that in modernity, we have lost the ability to say evil is in front of us even when it's standing right there. We're lacking that language that we had in the Second World War. We don't seem to be able to figure out who's wrong anymore. Everybody has a narrative and they all see it and it's almost like everybody in La La Land is equally true. No, not so much. Somebody's lying. And so um, the question is, uh, how are Christians in Palestine being treated with Hamas in control? Terribly. I would say Hamas in Gaza and Fatah in the West Bank have systematically robbed millions and millions of dollars in aid. Do you, you know that for every dollar the Africans get, the Palestinians get eight? 
the world is, is obsessed with this. If people ask me why I believe the Bible's literally true, my answer is Israel. My answer is that the Bible says literally at the end of time people will get angrier and angrier and that this land will be this, this hook that drags down everybody that touches it. I would argue that every president that tries to solve the Middle East crisis ruins his presidency from that day forward. Can't prove it, but I'm telling you anecdotally, it sure does look like that. Um, can Christians in Gaza worship openly? Yes, there are two churches in Gaza, church buildings, and uh, Orthodox and Catholic, and there's also house churches. The, among the born-again believers, they have a more difficult time because um, the way Hamas is structured, they run the daycares, they run the food distribution. So there's a Muslim entity that runs everything. And I've read to you already their perspective. They want everything to be Muslim. So if you're not Muslim, you're not going to get in the cheese line. It's not going to go well for you. So to be very honest with you, let me speak very well of some families. There are Muslim families that smuggle food for Christians because they may be adherents of Islam, but they're loving people, and they will not watch their neighbor starve. If they get caught, it's to their own peril, but they'll do it. And so there are a great many of them that are, um, that are risking their lives on behalf of people that don't believe what they believe. Uh, opinion. Did Sharon, from a biblical point of view, hamper the Lord's work when he ceded Gaza to the Palestinians? No, I don't think so. I'll tell you why. Um, if you were to read Joel chapter 3, and if you read the book of Zechariah, you will find that Gaza is specifically mentioned in end times literature, and that it's specifically mentioned as having railed against the people of God. In Matthew 25, when Jesus comes back and he sits on the Mount of Olives, he divides the people, the sheep from the goats, on the basis of how they took care of his brethren. But his brethren, in the context, are either Christians or Jews. But then he says, you better hope I don't come on Sabbath. So I'm thinking it's Jews that he's worried about, not Christians. And if that's true, then Jesus literally makes his line around how people treated the Jewish people. And you know what is said of Gaza? because you loved to do damage and destruction to my people. Now, that's an interesting phrase for what they are. I, I think, though, why did I not think that Sharon was wrong? Um, Gaza, Khan Yunus, the area uh, of the Gaza Strip, it's about 15, 16 miles north to south, maybe three to five miles uh, wide. Israelis didn't want to go there. You only went there when you were in the army, and frankly, it was scary. And so there was no real reason for them to maintain that. The settlements that were there were um, beneficial settlements, but the security concerns and the dollars that were spent for the security of those or shekels spent to secure those, those settlements was so high that they could never produce enough to not make it a negative cash flow. So it was dragging down the state, I think Sharon was trying to do. In Israel, there's an old saying that only, uh, only a, a dove can make war and a lion can make peace. And so what you do is you get a hardline government, they make the peace. You get a softer government, they make war. And it, it just happens to be anecdotally what has happened in my lifetime. Is there any connection between Hamas and, with its charter and ISIS and its desire for a caliphate? Um, much to the press's um, shame, ISIS is in Gaza. They exist there. There are photographs of them. There's a training video that they have. It, um, it is the Indian broadcaster who found them and actually photographed them. So uh, they're already there. They have very similar views. I, I believe that the difficulty is that um, they come from two very different strains of leadership, and I'm not sure that those two will get along. So who knows how that can happen. What's a good source to get updates and news on what's going on in Gaza so that we know how best to pray for them? Everybody in the Middle East has a point of view. When it says sources in Jerusalem say, who's that, the guy at Dungate? Everybody's got a point of view. Everybody has a point of view. So everything you're getting, you need to filter through that point of view. And, I, and by the way, we're getting good at this in America. We really are. You know if it's this program, it's going to be right. And if it's this program, it's going to be left. And if it's this program, it's going to be absolutely confused. And so what you do is you watch and you try to figure out what facts am I given? This is the bottom line. What we have to do today is figure out where the facts are. That's why I don't watch my news. I read it. 
I highly recommend walking away from the television set and read the news. Go online, read the news. I'll tell you why. You will learn in one paragraph what she just said in half an hour. And, and, I, and then she'll say it again in another half an hour with headlines and across the bottom and breaking news that's been breaking three hours ago. And they're still telling me the same thing. I don't know how it's breaking, but apparently it breaks for a long time. How would you say we should pray for the situation? Here, here's what I would do. Number one, I would ask God to work through the networks of believers that are effectively reaching people. Gaza does have people being reached for Jesus Christ right now. There are people there. I know personally two people that managed to get food in this past week, and then I got an email afterwards out alive. You and I need to understand that there are some Christian warriors here that are suiting up big time. I, I'm a little league. They're major league. They're walking into the flying bullets and saying, I've got to get this medicine to this family in that house or they won't have their medicine. And uh, we contribute to that. Global Vision's a part of that, but we're a very small part of a very big operation of things that has to go on. I would also be very careful to ask the Lord to continue to direct the minds and hearts of our people. Speak things that are true. Uh, Be careful not to pass on everything you read from every source. Be very careful what you post. Most of it has so much slant to it, it's of precious little good. So really, um, prayerfully, here's what you know. Um, nine hours ago, bombing started again, and people are as terrified as you would be if you were in a home and bombs were going off around you. So I'm not sure we need to know more than that to know how to, play, to pray. We're going to end in just a few minutes. Has the turmoil in the Middle East brought Israel closer or further from the Lord? It's a very strange thing. Israelis are very spiritual people. They... They know that in their past there was a deep and real connection to God. Many of my Israeli friends, I would say, are both religious and spiritual, but not necessarily allowing the Bible to change their daily behaviors. You might have a friend who does the Christmas Easter Christianity. Uh, I don't, they're not exactly the same, but there's a lot of things about that. Um, question was, what exactly is ISIS and how are they different from other groups? ISIS is the Islamic State. It is a group of originally um, about eight different groups that came together and saw a weakness in the swath of land in the northern part of Iraq. There are three very large Christian communities. Well, I should say two. Mosul's gone. But there are two left. And um, they decided that they would go after the Zoroastrians, they would go after the Christians, they would go after anybody who was not their viewpoint, and they would execute and roll through towns in the most brutal fashion possible. There's very little I can say to make them sound, well, on balance, they're good people. These are brutal thugs, and there are, they are now well-funded They have hit two banks, and they have a lot of money, and they've got a lot of arms. Unfortunately, in my view, we withdrew from Iraq without doing two of the requisite things you have to do in modern warfare. One of them is leave somebody responsible in charge. I I believe that our president did what what we in the polls told him we wanted him to do, which was withdraw those people. The problem is, when you withdraw too quickly, you actually can create another problem. And so the narrative goes on and on and on, and we're starting to really learn how this really works. You're going to keep hearing over and over and over about how the people of Gaza were standing against occupation, but they haven't been occupied at all. Everybody got out of there years ago. Then you're going to hear, well, they were walled in. Yeah, but they managed to get a lot of concrete. How'd that get in there? They weren't walled in. There are trucks going by every day. It's just that they couldn't get everything they wanted. They got food, they got medicine, they got concrete. They got pipes for their water system. They made rockets and they made tunnels with them. That's what happened. So now you get to Iraq and you have the Americans being the bad guys and we become the exact same narrative of the way we beat up people and we did everything wrong. I don't think that's really true. Think that, can I just say that I I think that the world doesn't really understand America. 
they don't really understand that if we could forfeit next tomorrow's lunch and that would feed a third world nation, I bet you a majority of Americans would do it hands down. We're a giving lot of people. I say that for my friends overseas. We are a giving lot of people. We're not trying to run around and police the world or muscle the world. That's not the problem. The problem with is there is no, no benefit to being a superpower if you have to sit back and watch people nibble at each other. There is no benefit if somebody doesn't step up. We have withdrawn from the world stage. Russia knows it. ISIS knows it. And basically, if you live outside this country, it's pretty obvious that that is what we've done. The stature of the country has changed as we have withdrawn. I am not blaming the president. I believe he was doing what the polls were telling him to do. I think in the complexity of a situation, we don't want to see our boys and girls go over to some place that they're never going to go uh, for any other reason and, and get themselves killed with a roadside bomb. So it's easy to get to that place. But the Yazidis, the uh, Zoroastrians, the Christians that are in northern Iraq, I think that they are badly suffering at this era. I have a, one, what is the situation for Iraqi qu- Christians? And I would just say that in Mosul, Baghdadi, or uh, what is called uh, Karakosh, and Arbil along the Tig- Tigris River, tens of thousands of Christians have been evacuated. The Islamic State group has occupied and destroyed churches. They've removed the crosses. They've destroyed every manuscript they could find. There are 100,000 Christians that have crossed over into the Kurdistan region, and the Kurdistan troops that were defending them also took flight. The Sunni militants have strengthened their grip on the Kurdish region, and the Kurds don't really stand a chance against ISIS. I mean, to be honest with you, the reason that the president sent in that bomber was because you're, you're, these are mismatched, badly mismatched. You have to understand that ISIS has already terrorized the entire region. Everybody's afraid of them. Everybody's afraid of them. And the problem is that um, in Iraq, in the month of July, 1,600 people died. You heard about Israel and you heard about Gaza, but you didn't hear about Iraq. 1,600 people died to the violence there And here's what the UN said. I am concerned about the rising number of casualties in Iraq. Did you notice the word was not appalled or outraged like when it's Israel, but I am concerned. Uh, What else could Israel possibly do to be above reproach in its response to the Hamas attacks or in its dealing with Gaza? I would say that they are only now learning to put foreign press with the forward uh, troops. Um, I went to, to Lebanon during the Operation Peace for Galilee. And I served in the press corps. There were 56 of us that told the world what happened in Lebanon. And what I can tell you is this. The Israelis have done a, uh, they've been too guarded with foreign press. Actually, here's what's happened. Did you notice the last week everything shifted? Israel was getting pounded for a few days. Then there was a ceasefire and all of a sudden they started to look better. Here's what happened. The foreign press couldn't file their reports because they were in the war zone. So they had to get out of their war zone, get to Tel Aviv, uplink their stuff, and all of a sudden, now there's real evidence that these guys really were firing from hospitals. And they really, because you have a whole bunch of press that were out there going, this is just Jewish lies, except for now there's video. And once you have video, done deal. I will tell you that in Lebanon, I saw this happen exactly. I reported for INN, which went to CBS News back in the Dan Rather days. And here's what I can tell you. They were using hospitals and schools routinely to attack from. This is a guy who stood in the place and saw it with his eyes. I'm telling you, I'm not doing this to to wave any Israeli flag. I'm telling you, it's the truth. This is the way they wage war, because casualties help their cause. And that's why they do what they do. Last, Last call here. What's the significance of God's command to pray for the peace of Jerusalem? If you're going to, um, I, I've been married now uh, just about 30 years, and she was just a baby when I married her. If you want to love my wife, you have to love what she loves. And so I've learned to love things I didn't know I would love. I, you're going you're gonna to absolutely think I'm not telling the truth, but I promise you it's true. I used to eat food just to live. It's my wife that did this to me. She actually made me taste the food. And what happens is after a while, you start, to, you start to love what the other person loves, and then you become like each other. And some of you have been together so long, you're starting to look like each other. I love that. I love that. 
here's the truth. Because, because we're in a situation where I want her to know that I love her, I invest my heart in things that I know she cares about. And you have no idea. I have dragged this woman all over the earth and had her shot at in her own home. And she's, she, we have literally sat behind sandbags, had spaghetti, and watched a war. All the way back in the very beginning, God created, and he put man on the earth and said, I'm the owner, you're the manager. When you need supplies, talk to me, I'm the owner. And that's the beginning of the prayer life. And what I found is that often I can't affect the situation. I can't change it. More and more, as we become a people that are surrounded by the 24-7 news, we feel like victims. Because everything's happening, and it's all happening so fast, and I can't even figure out how my phone works. And, and, and by the time I do, they update it, and now it doesn't work that way anymore. And then they send me a, a, an adjustment to my bill that's 18 pages long in number four font and say, agree or disagree. I don't even know what it means. How do I know if I agree? So, so I find myself in the complexity to be confounded. Prayer helps me satisfy a need in my life to come up to the Lord and say, what do you care about? What, what matters to you? And, and I will tell you that anybody who says to you, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Anybody who tries to tell you that's done away with doesn't know my life. A kid from New Jersey who didn't offer anything to anybody. And God has been so good to me, I can't tell you how spoiled I am. I don't want you to know. (laughs) But I can tell you this. The more time I spend with the Lord, the more it's not about me informing him of anything. Because he's got a pretty good news service up there in Heaven Network News. The more it's about me understanding where his heart is. He loves a people and he will again remember his love for that people. Be careful not to stick a finger in the apple of God's eye and think you'll get away with it. It's not a wise thing to do. 